All right, so this is Cherry Springs 2023, and I am here with a big celebrity, um, Trevor Jones. So Trevor Jones, say hi. Hi, everybody. Now, when was the first time you came to Cherry Springs? My first time, believe it or not, was nine years ago, 2014. I came up with the guys from my local astronomy club in Canada, the Niagara Center, and it was my first experience here, and it was uh, it was mind blowing, really, to see the sky. The Mortal Two was the darkest sky I'd ever seen at the time, and it absolutely blew my mind. I knew I'd be back as many times as possible. Do you think it's gotten a little bit uh, more light polluted since then? Um, it's. I, I, I bet it has to a degree, but it's still still very good. I mean, just because it's increasing everywhere, still a very solid Bortle 2 sky. Uh, no complaints. Yeah, I know we were talking with Adam Toter earlier, and he was saying about how like astronomy in this area is almost becoming the industry that the, that the neighborhood depends upon, kind of like tourist industry. Right. Yeah, uh, Yeah. which is great to see that, that people, the, the average person, is, is starting to hear more about stargazing and astronomy, and you'll see families come up here and just say, we heard this is a great place to see the stars so that's awesome now with the digital phones and everything you know, everybody's getting more and more plugged into their phones and so forth I know I have no phone up here because I have no signal but what do you think of like a lot of these apps and so forth that are allowing people uh, see objects in space maybe tie up to a camera kind of like the ZWO Sea Star that's come out and I know there's been a bunch of others and so forth it's yeah mixed feelings kind of bittersweet because the, the purist with the you know to, to view an object through the eyepiece at a star party the way it used to be done there's something very special about that and it's a different experience mm -hmm. as soon as you're looking at that, that that phone screen and seeing a, a looped video or, or looped three second image it's very different than the experience of actually being live through the eyepiece with that being said it's great for getting new people into the hobby because um, it's more exciting it's more gratifying to see you get on the dumbbell nebula you're doing a live video and you see green you see the color in it mm -hmm. So it's great for outreach. There's there's pluses and minuses, but the two are, are quite different, I think. I know. I'm going to ask you soon about how you got into astrophotography, but I know what got me into it is I was really disappointed that no matter how big a scope I got through the eyepiece, I would never be able to see color because it's too faint. But with a camera, I guess you can in a sense see it. Now, now when did you start astrophotography? Yeah, so kind of that similar kind of story where I had a visual Dobsonian telescope in the backyard. This is way back in 2010. Mm -hmm. And the first time I actually put my little point and shoot Canon power shot up to the eyepiece and it allowed me to take like a five second exposure. Terrible little sensor on this thing. But I shot the Orion Nebula and saw purple, like a purple glow and that was it for me. I'm like, I need more of this. I need to, because a big thing for me was I'd be out there seeing things and I'd want to show someone or tell them what I saw so the idea of capturing it through a photo I could easily show them what I saw last night so that's yeah that's I gotta I say Orion got me restarted because because I did film for a while and then I kind of got out of the hobby college and everything but then like I didn't try with my digital cameras because everyone was like uh digital cameras aren't good enough yet and then I tried Orion and I got the same thing I, I saw that purple and I was like whoa I need more of this <laughs> yeah yeah, that's exactly yeah. it got a lot I think Orion got a lot of people <laughs> yeah. now um, what you think is like the toughest object that you'd like to kind of go after next Ooh, so all of the the dark dusty stuff I, I think of Cepheus a lot and some of the dusty regions in there um, I did the embryo nebula last fall that was one of the tougher objects I've ever shot and I did that from Boral one skies at mm. the Okitech star party yeah I I don't really have one in mind. Actually, the Dark Shark Nebula, that, that's one that's eluded me. I've tried to get, I just didn't have enough exposure time. Things didn't work out. So that's probably the, the difficult target I've been thinking about. Now, what's your opinion with like uh, mono versus one shot color? And you know I'm asking this because I'm the Narrowband channel. But. I mean, so there's, there's a, a case for both. They both do different things very well. I love them both in certain situations. Mono makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. if, you're shoot, if it's a night with the moon is out and you're shooting in narrowband on an, on an emission nebula, you'll want to shoot with a monochrome camera, not, not a color camera to get a quarter of that signal or less. So a mono makes a lot of sense. It is a little bit more work not so much if you have a filter wheel and you can automatically filter go through those filters it's more in the processing side getting flats for each lrgb filter stuff like that so there's more compiling and getting things together one shot color is great because it's you know that one, five minute exposure full color stack them up process it so instant gratification and in a spot like this i would never think of shooting and 
maybe you'll disagree with me, I wouldn't shoot LRGB at a location like this. Mm -hmm. One shot color, two minute exposures, and just get three hours if possible. I think uh, OSC makes more sense under a really nice sky. Yeah, it does, it does. Like, uh, I'm a hardcore narrowband guy like me, even like <laughs> shoots RGB here. But, so here, I know, the big thing now has been these dual band narrow band filters mm -hmm. and i've even seen like sharp stars come out with a pair one does oxygen and hydrogen and the other one does i think it's oxygen and sulfur as well okay which allows you to kind of be halfway in between and that you know you're you can then get a true sho image out of a one shot narrow band color now i like this because i think that it's getting more people kind of one step deeper into the hobby and what's, what's your opinion though yeah i I feel the same way. They, it's, it's funny to think that they've only been around for maybe the last five years or so. Like the Optolong oh, yeah. L Enhance was kind of one of the the newer options. I, they're really cool from the city. If you're in light pollution, it's amazing what a dual band filter can do on a bright nebula. Like you can shoot the Lagoon Nebula and it would turn out beautiful, nice and punchy and contrasty with a color camera from like a Bortle Seven. With that being said, if you're 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 big on natural star colors and a really clean signal, you're gonna have to put in the work and do it the narrow band or LRGB way, but they're they're nice for getting a really satisfying punchy image, you know, in limited time. They're a lot of fun. Yeah, those darn stars. <laughs> but yeah, aren't they? They're the most. Diff we're we're constantly fighting to to preserve those the star quality and color. It's like the more you're in this hobby, you realize how how much time is spent on stars. So we're gonna segue now into like camera lenses because I know a lot of people start out with what they already have, which is you know typically a mirrorless camera. And the biggest gripe that I have, you know, I buy these fast lenses and I get them and I have to stop them down three stops. You know, you, yeah. you have the same experience. Yeah, I, I so because I'm I, I like processing my images and I feel like I can manipulate the stars kind of the way I want to in the end. I, I find myself leaving it even more open than people would recommend. Uh, my Rokinon f2 lens, I, I have shot with that right at f2 or f2.8 just to get that light gathering ability. But yeah, the, the star quality degrades as you you know use those benefits of a fast lens. But yeah, it's kind of it's kind of sad to it's, that's the reason you got this these fast optics mm -hmm. to to have to stop down. But um, the quality improves obviously as you do that. And every lens is different. Some some perform better wide open than others, as you know. Oh yeah, you can get a different batch, like a different production batch. I know, like we were just talking about the lens. I'm using the 17 millimeter f1.2. Some guys can use it wide open. I can't use my coffee wide open. I have to stop it down to about f2.8 in order to really use it. And that happens in the telescope world too, right? It's a it's a quality control issue. They're they're making whatever 10,000 units. You're gonna there's gonna be a, a dozen or so bad copies in there. And like some people, I don't think will even realize they have a bad copy unless you really know what to look for and you're a pixel peeper, peeper, peeper and you're looking at the edges of the image. It's like, how much do you scrutinize the quality of your lens? Well, I know, like in this hobby, like we're, this is probably the most scientific branch of photography in general. For sure. Because, you know, we, we approach everything very scientifically and so forth. And so this is kind of why we agonize about these kinds of details. And and I want to tell people, like, don't be scared of that. You know, it's really, it's just a process. You follow the steps and you ask questions and you come to star parties like this where you can like talk to people in person and you know get coaching you know and and that's actually a good question so did you have like a mentor or something like that to kind of help you in the early stages of your astro journey? Yeah, so we live in this online world where you can DM people and you can watch YouTube tutorials. So we have all this information, but really you can't beat a one-on-one -on -one mentor or conversation with someone that can tell you exact answers to your questions, which can be hard to come by. That's why I like, it was my local astronomy club. There was a group of guys that would go up out to our local observatory. Uh, there was about five or six astro imagers. We were all using DSLRs at the time but they showed me the ropes and that just seeing their rigs and, and and building one that was just almost exactly the way theirs was and it's like I know this is gonna work because they're doing it mm -hmm. that's really big so if you can find a group of people in person to meet up and do it that'll save you so much time and frustration yes. 
I know like my my journey kind of like getting back into this hobby started about seven years ago it was joining a club you know and basically sitting next to old farts you know and some of them were kind of hard to get along with but you know it, <laughs> you'll find your crowd yeah <laughs> yes exactly but I mean you got to respect them because they really know this guy some of them I mean you know we have one guy that I, I just kind of worship man he, he can like take that 17 inch 1500 no 15,000 millimeter focal length scope and point it right at objects that I don't even know about you know so. <laughs> yeah th those there's there's those guys exist too but you'll find there'll be a group of astrophotographers in any astronomy club that'll be like I just want to talk about star trackers and in and, and narrowband imaging and stuff and those guys can do their own thing talking about magnitude and double stars and all that <laughs> <laughs> um so I guess like a couple other questions I have for you be like with the industry like where do you think like like we've had a couple big breakthroughs lately dual band narrow band filters of course is one really big one maybe with sensors and so forth becoming backside illuminated was another big one that i think that will really help people out. Oh, harmonic mounts i was going to say um what do you think might be like kind of like the next big thing oh man it's really hard to say it's we've really been spoiled with the tech progression in this hobby uh, what I was talking to someone yesterday about this. I think we're going to see more harmonic drive mounts mm -hmm. um, because it is proven now. I think early, when it was first introduced, you know, no counterweight balance issues, all this stuff. Does it need auto guiding? I think a lot of those questions have been answered now, and it works. Mm -hmm. And it makes a lot of sense to have a, a smaller form factor and to you know, it's more travel friendly. So I think more companies are going to jump on board with with that technology. And then other than that, I mean, I don't think telescope scopes have much room like optics we've kind of mastered like you you know better exotic glass you can use in these you know quadruplet lens designs but there's I don't think there's much more to go in terms of advancement for telescopes but the camera sensor technology they keep getting bigger and the QE kept, keeps getting better mm -hmm. lower read noise but even again we're, we're it's hard to to imagine them getting much better than they are right now yeah. i know like mouse getting smaller that was that was kind of one of the things that was stuck at a certain size for a very long time and and this has i don't know p picking up my am5 is so much easier than picking up my i have 45. <laughs> yeah yeah i know it's almost you almost got used to counterweights and these heavy mounts like mm -hmm. even the eq6r is one of the most popular equatorial go-to mounts and it's so popular it's so great but it's very very heavy yeah. and now a, an am5 can do pretty well the same thing and you can one hand pick it up so it's kind of a big deal yeah. and, I, and photography in general like what has opened up photography to everybody is stuff getting smaller and more portable and more accessible to the market because you know when cameras first came out they were view cameras and they were typically shot 14 by 11 inch plates you know, and then they got smaller, and then World War One. You know, those four by fives were popular, and then by World War Two, thirty-five millimeter was kind of the thing. But it, of course, it wasn't accepted professionally. But you know, now today, of course, we've got thirty-five millimeter everywhere, and it's, it's kind of considered the gold standard, so to speak. But yeah, seeing seeing stuff get smaller and lighter where it can and should is you know just making it easier for people to get into yeah and I mean we haven't talked about smartphones a lot of people are interested so because I'm I like a nice quality sensor and just to I know that the you can max out with what a small phone camera sensor can do but they keep people are interested in it they keep improving that the the night mode and the astrophotography mode we'll see where that goes I know that there's no end in sight for the progression in that because I think it's a huge selling point for phones now it's like oh you can do astrophotography with this phone and you can can in a simple level and maybe that will lead to a real camera after that but it's it's a market I've been that surprised me over the last few years is, is the smartphones so for you and your channel like what do you think is gonna be next for you and your wife and so forth as you kind of like build on this hobby I'm really focusing on less videos but higher quality with a real a strong message a strong story and, and the big thing I try to do is that for anyone new coming to the channel, they can enjoy and watch a video, get introduced to, to astrophotography, but I'm, at the same time, I'm not, for my existing subscribers, I'm not, I'm still talking to them too. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to, it's just weird to be at this point on the channel. I, I feel like it's, it's the hardest point because I feel like I have to choose a direction. But yeah, I'm just focusing on, on the storytelling and the quality and to reaching as many people as possible. That's kind of the, the guiding light. Now, my last question, which is one I, I usually ask here at Cherry Springs, is like, so light pollution is becoming a, more and more of a problem every year. Um, what, have you, what are you doing to like kind of 
fight the good fight. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of like the lifelong mission in, and more so for my wife, Ashley, she's all about it. She's a member of IDA. So we're, we're trying to work on local change, what we can do to, to fight against it because where we live, it's not even a, a topic of discussion. People think uh, outdoor illuminating their, 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 their trees on the yard, it's pretty. Like no one even, the word, the term light pollution is foreign to them. So we've got so much work to do there. Uh, it's an awareness thing and because we reach a lot of people on, on the YouTube channel, there's a lot of things we can do for awareness. I don't want to sound preachy and everything, but really it's, it's, it's kind of a lifelong mission of ours to make some sort of uh, a difference on that front. All right, all right. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you, Trevor. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for having me.